I know, really. So, so if you have any questions, just feel free right up, <coughs> right up front to ask. Okay. So I mean, we'll just do this as a personal, personal talk here uh, for the three of you. Well, thank you. So um, they gave me this title: Who is the surgical candidate? And uh, it's really uh, ultimately uh, how do we uh, try to figure out what's going on? Okay. So that's kind of where we're at at this point. Um, just to give you just an overview, introduction, uh, surgical treatment of epilepsy actually has been around a long, long time. Uh, the first epilepsy surgery was actually in the 19th century, so it's, it's not really that new from that perspective. Um, most of the data and the literature that you've been hearing is in adults, but there are also really uh, wonderful areas um, where they've shown really good to excellent outcomes. But those are best when we're able to identify specifically uh, where the seizures are coming from. Epilepsy, remember, is also the most common neurologic disorder in childhood. And so because of that, we really are dealing with a very large number of patients. And surgery, and I'm a neurosurgeon, um, really has to be considered when alternative treatments or medications have failed. So um, just some key points and maybe just some of the learning and maybe some of the others may or may not have mentioned it, but epilepsy is considered a functional disorder. So that's a disorder where the brain itself has an abnormal network that's causing the dysfunction, causing the seizures. In those instances where we can identify the network, and particularly if that network is not part of a, um, a normal network, so I'll talk a little bit about that later on, is that surgery should be considered the best option if we're able to find that focus or find that network. Uh, another key point is that the best outcomes, the best that we can achieve and in including uh, cure, are those where there's very fine or very small areas of focal onset of the seizures. It's in an area that we can take safely and in patients that have really not uh, uh, been able to uh, stay seizure free without a number of medications. We do know that even for patients that have multifocal or diffuse epilepsy or in regions of, of eloquent cortex, then those are instances that we still can do stuff. And as was mentioned in probably a lot of the other talks, we, it's just a matter of understanding that before we go forward and, and make that decision. So I'm just going to show um, kind of a, a case that's really a typical um, one that we might see in a very young child. This is a three-month-old female. She was diagnosed early on with tuberous sclerosis, but really they noted that she was having seizures really at about six weeks of age. Probably started sooner, but it wasn't really uh, identified before that. Now she was having what was considered catastrophic epilepsy, so she was having 50 to 60 seizures a day. And while the medications maybe reduced those down initially, the problem was that the seizures came back and came back with a storm. And then they would try rapid uh, succession of medications, but unfortunately the child really wasn't doing much, really had poor development and poor neurologic exam. So um, here's the MRI um, that we can see. That again, this, the EEG confirmed that the seizures were coming from the left frontal region. And then you can see here in the arrow that I presented, here on these MRIs, this would be the front, here's her right and the left, you can see the area of abnormality within the brain, particularly when you compare uh, the two sides. And you can see that this is looking at her from, uh, from in front, and again, you're seeing more normal side here on the right, and then this, this area, which is a very, very large abnormal area of brain um, seen on the left there. So. With that scenario, I'm just going to sort of go into a little bit of kind of what are our concerns and, and what do we know. Well, I mean, uh, many of you probably have seen this kind of slide before, which just shows the incidence of epilepsy by age. And, you know, clearly we have an early period of epilepsy, which are really due to some of the developmental anomalies, um, some of the acquired epilepsies that occur throughout a lifetime, and then particularly as we... Uh, as we age. Now this is old data and we still use the 1 in 26 will develop uh, epilepsy during their lifetime. Um, we haven't been able to really um, reduce the number of patients who eventually will end up with epilepsy. 
and the part of it is our understanding of it we understand now that there's genetic components we understand now that there's lesional components whether you have a tumor or a vascular malformation uh, we know that there are a certain number of patients that will develop post-traumatic epilepsy so this this number actually stays pretty stable when we sort of look at the epidemiology over the years so even though this is data that's almost you know 20 30 years old um, we do know that um, the incidence is about the same now having said that some of the I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon but I I actually do adult epilepsy surgery as well but there are a number of different types that we see at different uh, ages and so in the adult we tend to see more complex partial seizures temporal lobe origin so again this is some of the data where for whatever reason in these acquired or over time that they can develop uh, temporal lobe origin seizures they can very often have a small focus and <clears throat> small should be put in quotes but that could be due to a tumor or a vascular malformation if they had a stroke or something along those lines and then we often consider intractable if they're having greater than one seizure per month but intractable also is different definitions for different people so if you've listened to a couple of different speakers intractable is any seizure that's causing an impact on um, quality of life or the ability to function and so when we start to say intractable they may have a seizure a month but and that may be okay but in some patients if they're having a seizure every six months and they're not able to drive then that's something that's um, clearly intractable and it's something that's impactful on their quality of life now children on the other hand as I mentioned often have developmental issues those can be as a result more diffuse or generalized seizure types um, they could be outside of the temporal lobe because it just like the example that I gave um, they can be often not small so they could be in a much larger area they could be a whole hemisphere if you've heard of hemimegalencephaly um, they can have numerous seizures per day and that can be considered under control and then unfortunately is that the seizures as well as the amount of medication needed to control the seizures often have a major impact on their ability to think and grow and develop normally again you've probably seen this slide where again where you look at how often people become seizure free with medication uh, 50 percent will get uh, be seizure free with the first drug another third will become um, uh, up to a third uh, will be up uh, seizure free with a second drug but then you start to get diminishing returns to the point where one to four percent by the time you get to a third or more drugs in those instances so we're left with about a third of patients who remain refractory uh, to epilepsy and so this treatment yes please correct so that goes back to my definition of intractable so you're either intractable because you have you're still having seizures that are impacting your life or the medications are having such an extent of your um, on your quality of life you know making it's again causing lethargy sleepiness you're not able to function or speak um, but it's important um, even if you um, uh, even if you have that and they started you on medication and you've got let's say reasonable control it would be important to know really where the source of the seizures are because um, there can be instances where those seizures started because there is a brain tumor um, growing and it may not have been noticed on the first um, scan and in fact you know I had a close colleague um, who had new onset seizures scan looked fine um, kind of was controlled with medicine broke through kept breaking through more medicines and they didn't rescan them till a year later and then there was a large tumor there so those are the kinds of things where regular follow-up is very important especially if the seizures are getting worse and so so again just going back and again there have been a number of speakers who've talked about this when we sort of look at the total population of patients in the United States so there's about three million patients in the United States living with epilepsy about a third of them or about a million patients um, are intractable and when we look at the number of patients who are having um, surgery 
um, there's only about maybe about 7,000 patients per year. So you can see the huge treatment gap of patients who are not getting um, adequately treated. And maybe for that matter, taking a step back, the source of this talk is really adequately evaluated. And so it's important when we sort of look at this that there's often patients that go 20 years with intractable seizures that have really not explored the options where surgery might have some potential positive impact. So that's why it's important to um, go forward to understand where the seizures are coming from because ultimately we want to try to figure out, you know, are there better ways? And even just through my career over the last 20 years, you know, I've seen such amazing gains in the technologies and our understandings and all the different things that we do for seizures that just getting a one-time evaluation and calling it a day is really inadequate because I think, you know, there's always something new on the horizon and we need to seek those out. And I'll talk a little bit about that a little later on. So what are the goals of any epilepsy intervention? intervention? Well, clearly we want to stop the seizures. Um, but also we want to prevent a further brain injury or interference with normal function. So when we see patients, even if they've got good control on medicines, if they're having ongoing seizures or the medicines are such a level that it's impacting on ability to think or function or uh, work, you know, those different things, well then clearly that's having an, an impact on uh, quality of life. And in children, we know that if we can stop the seizures, then we can also improve their developmental progress. So if, this is the, if these are the goals of epilepsy intervention, what are the goals of surgical intervention? The exact same things. And so surgery is not an alternative just because it's something different. It's really part of the continuum of what your team of, of uh, experts should be working with with regards to trying to get control and, and uh, be able to accomplish these different goals. Um, our surgical decision making is dependent on a number of different things. It includes the seizure type. So is it focal? Is it generalized? Is it on the right or the left? Is it in an area of important uh, motor areas or language areas? Those different things. And as well, is it lesional or non-lesional? If we see a lesion, most often in those instances, that's kind of where we should be focusing our attention because that's likely an area where uh, the seizures are coming from. Now, one of the exciting things, as I just mentioned, is that so lesional would be something like a brain tumor or an area where someone had a stroke or a trauma, infection, those kinds of things. Okay? Usually where there's like scar tissue or something that's disrupting the normal networks within the brain. And then, um, uh, yes, it includes dysplasia like that case that I presented. That would be considered lesional epilepsy. Now one of the things about dysplasia is that there are some dysplasias we can see and some we can't. And sometimes when we see a dysplasia, we have to also consider that there may be um, microscopic dysplasias that we can't visualize. And I'll point some of those out here. Okay? So as I just mentioned earlier, um, there are a lot of new technologies that allow us a better understanding of where that seizure focus may be. Um, those include um, some you know, fancy technologies with regards to source localization, anatomical imaging, functional imaging, mapping, all of these different things, and I'm going to give you a flavor of all of these as I, as I go through. Well, in the patient that has epilepsy, I mean, at a minimum, what we talk about is sort of this phase one or non-invasive evaluation. Now, this is the minimum, and, but it, we see this in the majority of cases where we get the history and the semiology. So that's basically, when did the seizure start? Was there any antecedent events? Um, is there you know, a trauma or brain tumor or something like that? Um, but then also the type of seizure. So we're looking for what are the manifestations? Is it a motor where the left arm goes up or the right arm goes up? Is it facial twitching? Is it staring? Those are all different things that will highlight for us kind of where the seizures might be arising. The next is the EEG. So, I mean, you've seen, you know, EEGs, all the squiggly lines, and the brain waves. But the EEG, both an EEG that's an outpatient EEG, as well as a video EEG, which correlates the 
brain waves with the semiology, if we have those together, then we can have potentially be able to say, oh yes, that's most likely coming from the right temporal lobe, for example. And so having that EEG both as the outpatient, but also importantly the video EEG, really allows us to, to better localize or at least get a clue of where those seizures might be coming from. So um, again, neuroimaging um, has been fantastic. Um, uh, believe it or not, I was training in the days of where we did just x-rays with air injection and uh, angiograms. Um, luckily, I came along right at the time when all the imaging came out, and uh, so I'm dating myself a little bit, but it's been fantastic to see over the years. Um, and so I'll, t I'll talk about these in, in my talk. Uh, neuropsychology is also very useful, so th if patients, um, let's say we're doing fine but now are starting to have some language difficulty because, um, and we pick this up on the neuropsychological assessment, that might point to us having areas where they might have problems with memory function due to, uh, with language is different than having memory problems with spatial learning, and that would say left versus right or dominant versus non-dominant. And so that's what the neuropsychology is for, is to provide us a baseline, but also to provide us what is the impact of the seizures on one's function, so on one's thinking and speaking and uh, cognitive um, calculations, math, space, those kinds of things. And then clearly some of the, the newer things are things like metabolic testing, genetic testing in many patients, and now you'll, you've heard other speakers with regards to these you know, um, epilepsy panels that really are able to start to pick up some of the genetic um, and molecular abnormalities. And then less often, amitol testing. We don't tend to do WADA testing, may have heard that term before uh, as much. We tended to now move toward other functional testing, but it's still there when we're, we're not able to really determine where memory function is and if we're trying to um, elucidate that. So let me talk a little bit about our neuroimaging because I think this is where we've made such huge gains. Um, we consider imaging to be a part of the non-invasive evaluation. Um, these are the different types of imaging that we can do. These include uh, anatomic imaging, which is your MRI scanner, your CT scan, those kinds of things. We don't tend to use CT anymore. Um, we use it for specific reasons, uh, but not to do a screening, so not part of really a phase one evaluation. And then you've heard of maybe functional imaging, so PET scanning, SPECT. Um, CISCOM, MR spectroscopy, these are what's called functional testing. So as I mentioned right at the front end is that epilepsy is a functional disorder, so these functional images, these functional tests are really part of our, our most important diagnostic tests in helping to uh, localize where the seizures are coming from. And then we do what's called electrophysiologic imaging, and so MEG is sort of fits into that because what you're looking for is sort of a marriage of where the EEG and the electrical abnormalities are and really laying those right on top of um, an MRI so that you can get a MEG and this then hopefully points out uh, where there's abnormalities. Um, that may be, that RICO is one of them, uh, GE has one, um, Le Ele um, Electa has one, so I think there's a number of different models, but yes, the MEG is really to marry the, what are the magnetic dipoles within the brain and map that onto an anatomic image. I'm going to show you some pictures in a sec. It's, it's not better, it's additive to an MRI. So here's an MRI, and if you look at this picture, there really isn't anything that we see that's abnormal on it, but when you start to add different sequences, here's a, what's called a T2 image, you can now start to see that there's maybe some difference between the two sides here, and then you can see when we do different sequences in different configurations that we can sort of pick out the different abnormalities in the brain. So here would be an area that if we had concordant data, meaning we have EEG that points to the left frontal, and we've now got an abnormality in the left frontal, well, this allows us more confidence that, wow, you know, this is where seizures might be coming from. 
Um, other areas that we are very interested in is what's called DTI, which is diffusion, diffusion tensor imaging. And uh, these fancy color pictures really show the tracks of the brain, how all the different connections and networks uh, align within the brain. Now this is just an anatomic image and we can often see changes in the DTI, let's say after a traumatic brain injury or after a tumor or uh, with a tumor uh, in a resection. Yes, sir. Well, the, it, someone's having seizures, but the well, EEG is negative? It hasn't been defined, but they think it is, but it's not showing up on EEG. Yeah, so we would first go to video EEG. No, the DTI is actually better for surgical planning because we want to know where the tracks are and, and what might be eloquent areas, let's say motor or connectivity from the eyes back to the occipital lobe. So the DTI is more of an anatomic image, it's not a functional image. And so even if the EEG is negative, we might go to other functional imaging, which I'm going to show you in just a sec. So again, if they're not able to sort of lateralize or localize based on the EEG, we would then go to functional imaging. So thanks for the leading because I'll go to functional imaging right now so we could go right there. So again, functional imaging, what we're trying to do is to elucidate where is normal function of the brain and where is the abnormal function. And so there are a number of different modalities. So here again are the different uh, functional imaging that's available now. And again, when I was starting out, um, it was only PET. And so I was doing my residency at UCLA, PET was now coming on the scene and that was the only real functional imaging that was available. And so really over the last 20, 25 years, we've really seen an explosion in this technology really to help to elucidate where uh, the seizures are coming from. So go ahead, sure. Ah, that's a great question. They're actually both, but it's mostly to get to the diagnosis because we do our surgical planning based on the diagnosis. So we have to do the diagnosis first. It's not for surgical planning. The DTI was for surgical planning, the one I showed. Uh, so should we be to our doctors that we want all these done, or? No, so that's a, very, that's a great question. Um, it really depends on your seizure syndrome. So like something like, oh, next slide. Um, this PET scan, here was a patient who had a left temporal, what seemed like left temporal lobe abnormality on the, on the MRI, um, but we weren't sure because the EEG was looking like maybe both sides. So then we just, a PET scan in this particular case was very, very effective in just saying, you only need this one functional test, and we were able to elucidate that the seizures were coming from the left temporal lobe here. So you don't need all of them. They end up being, you end up getting more of them if one doesn't really help to create that, that data concordance. So one of my earlier slides was if we, we, what we want is to have objective data that goes together. So is it the semiology, is it the EEG, is it the imaging? We want all of that data to give us one answer, but sometimes it's not so easy and so sometimes it can be confusing we would then start adding tests in order to figure that out. Does that help? Yeah, just, you know, obviously, um, I mean, we haven't had a PET scan yet, but they proved us to have that before. Yeah. Um, and we're just kind of moving forward in the process, but it's right. kind of like, you know, when you start hearing about kindling and how, like, you know, things can, like, progress worse the longer you take to, you know, do the surgery. Yeah, kind of like, that's what I pointed out in my earlier slide. That is a concern. You're absolutely yeah, right. So The plasticity changes, right. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And, and that's why in, in those instances we try to expedite this evaluation. And we will get most, the PET is really one of our first line functional images, but I'm going to show you some others that we use up front also, which helps to elucidate this. Um, so, yes, sir. 
Yeah, they, they have to be sedated. There's no question. I mean, we can't do an MRI without a child, you know, a five-year-old, uh, because they have to stay still for about 45 minutes. So it's, it is, that becomes weighing the decision of, you know, kind of risk-benefit. But uh, to know for sure that they don't have a lesion or that, you know, there's a specific abnormality, you know, those are the discussions that we have with the families. Well, there's always a risk of anesthesia. Someone could have a bad reaction to the medicine. They could have a converse reaction, those kinds of things. So, so here's the PET scan just showing left temporal hypometabolism. We can also take the PET and marry it on top of an MRI. So here you can see um, areas of normal metabolism, this orange area. These are the white matter, so this is expected. But here's an area of, of cortex that uh, was abnormal. We saw that on the MRI. The PET scan really matched up nicely. This was an area where we could get, uh, this was a situation where we got good concordance of data. Um, here's an uh, interictal spect. Um, again, this looks at blood flow, not metabolism per se. Um, maybe you can get a hint that there's some decreased blood flow in this area where you see these crosshairs. It's not particularly accurate as you can see from the uh, sensitivity um, and the like, but here's the ictal spect. Uh, so this is when they give an injection right at the time someone is having a seizure. You can now see that there's, now it's really hot because an area that's having a seizure will increase its metabolism. The brain's response to increased metabolism is increased blood flow. And so you see this really nice picture here. And then if we put them together, you can then see the ictal so having a seizure, not having a seizure, and now you can do what's called syscom, which is to subtract those images and then put that on your MRI, and now you can sort of see where this hot spot is relative to the brain. And so this now tells us this child is having their seizures coming from this location. I now have the MRI, which then allows me to do surgical planning for this particular area. Okay. Um, functional MRI, you probably have heard about this. Mostly functional MRI was developed as a task-based MRI. So this is, goes back a little bit to your question. Um, this is one where they do the MRI while they're laying still in the, in the MRI scanner. Um, that's why it's tough to do in kids. Um, but in those, what they can do is they'll do certain tasks like tapping a finger, um, reading numbers, one, two, three, four, five, while they're doing the MRI scan. And what they're looking for is by doing those skills, so when I start to count, one, two, three, four, five, et cetera, what I'm doing is I'm activating an area of my brain that's for counting. And when I activate that, the blood increases the metabolism, which then increases the blood flow, which then the MRI is able to read, and that's how we do functional MRI. And so that's kind of the simplified uh, version to, to do it. Um, it's difficult. Exactly. So that's why it's difficult to impossible to do in, in children, young children. I've had, um, we had a child as young as nine who was able to, uh, to do it. Um, probably some of the other neurologists with training, some of the kids can kind of lay still enough, especially if they're going through tasks so it's not too boring. Um, but it's very, very difficult to do in kids. So thanks for the lead in again. You know, I should have you in my audience all the time. Um, resting state. So yes, please. For language. Yeah. Right. The water test is invasive. What that is is uh, angiogram, so running a catheter up to the temporal lobe, basically, or up into the carotid. Um, and the idea is to put that part of the brain to sleep for a short period of time. And so the WADA has the potential for complications when you do an angiogram, so you have risk to the where they put the catheter in. There's a risk of blood clots and stroke and those kinds of things. It is for motor and for uh, language and for some of the visual stuff. Um, the thing where it's not effective is for memory. So that's very, very difficult to test. So if we're trying to decide on whether memory function is adequate on one side or the other, 
then we, we still use the WADA. Okay? We don't tend to use it again in young children. Yeah, that's tough to do, uh, especially for 45 minutes. And each sequence is a few minutes long. And, and if there's any movement, it degrades the image. Which then brings me to the next one, which is resting state. So this now is the answer that we've seen in the last few years for evaluating children. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples. Um, as a result, we can now look at normal networks and then look at where there's abnormal networks. And what resting state does is it looks at blood flow over time where you would expect there to be normal networks. So we look at motor, we look at visual, we look at memory, uh, we look at language, we don't look at memory, excuse me. Um, but again, those sequences are really looking at blood flow. So we're looking at where the, for lack of a better word, high volume tracks. So remember I showed you the DTI with those big wide um, fiber tracks, those connections. That's what this um, functional MRI, this resting state functional MRI picks up. So let me just show you some pictures. Here just is just some areas where they can pick up networks looking at different functions. So motor cortex, here's some executive control right in the prefrontal cortex. Here's where visual areas are medial visual areas. So this is the nice thing about the resting state, and this could be done under anesthesia. And so this goes to why we can do this uh, in children. And then to go to um, your question about language, we can also pick up language networks. So here's one. You don't see it so well here, but this is the left side. This is the right side. And here we can see all of the language networks. We see some language networks in everybody on the contralateral side, but at least in this case, you can see how much more dominant the networks are on the left side here compared to the right. And we could do this in, in very young children. We've done it in children as young as two to three years of age, um, where language is already starting to develop. And they're already starting to develop some dominance. Now, if we get, if we're able to um, do surgery and we have to go into a language area, we want to do it in as young a, a patient as possible because they'll move that language area over to the other side, uh, really up until about nine or ten years of age. Um, this is just now showing why uh, resting state can also be used to localize an abnormal network. So here where the crosshairs are, we can see that there's an abnormal functional network here that shouldn't exist, but in this particular patient, it does exist. So we get, so going back to your earlier question, um, with the video EEG and the MRI, with patients with seizures, we're getting these resting states up front. Since they're already under sedation, we're already gonna be able to, so we, it's part of our epilepsy protocol, okay? Now, the other thing is, is we, um, when patients have brain tumors and we're trying to figure out where they're, um, uh, seizures are relative to the to the tumor. If we have a patient who has a brain tumor here, well, the seizures could be coming from here, they could be coming from here, they could be coming from all of here, but you can see in this particular patient, this network is right adjacent to the area of the tumor. And so if we want to try to cure not just the tumor, but also cure them of their seizures, we have to make sure that we take into account that part of the network uh, that's also involved. Okay, so I'm going to move from resting state to MEG. Um, MEG is basically taking all of these EEG signals, marrying them onto the MRI, and then we get this sort of uh, dense plot of where there's abnormal signal sources. And so that's why this is considered um, a magnetic source imaging. So we're using the mag magnetic dipoles of the brain, the electrical physiologic characteristics, marrying that to the anatomic image, and then basically giving us a plan of where the seizures are coming from. Is that, um, can they do that under yes, that's under sedation. So here's a great example. This was a 14-year-old young man who, interestingly enough, going back to what was said earlier, is that um, he had 
on his scalp EEG, his seizures seemed to be coming from the front, but yet we had this abnormal area toward the back. Well, here's his, his MEG study, and you can see that the seizure networks are really focused in the back. We don't see anything right up front. And so, you know, the, here was a case where uh, we went in and we resected that area and the patient was seizure free. And, and again, as we talked about, epilepsy is a functional disorder. It's a seizure network. It's not necessarily a specific spot. And so while in this patient, sorry, um, this lesion here, we know that, there, that this may have been what we call the primary generator, but it was clearly spreading towards the front there um, and causing what was being picked up by the scalp EEG. Okay, so that's kind of our non-invasive way that we figure out where the seizures are coming from. I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, invasive ones. Let me just make sure I'm okay for time. Yes, good. Um, so these are some of the um, invasive monitoring. So why would your doctor recommend either grids or depth electrodes or those kinds of things? And that's really because we don't know really exactly where the seizures are coming from and or we don't know where those seizures are coming from relative to where there's really important functions like motor or language or those kinds of things. And so we, we, if we have insufficient data to lateralize or localize the seizures, or we're getting conflicting data, so it's saying one test is saying it's on the right, another test is saying it's on the left, um, or as I mentioned, where is it relative to motor or language? Uh, these are the different invasive uh, methods that we have. So we can do it acutely. So if we open up thing, um, the um, open up uh, to expose the brain, we can do during that short period of time during surgery do some mapping. Uh, but at least in children, we tend to do more of the chronic. So we implant either surface or depth electrodes or a combination, and I'll show you that in a bit, um, where we're able to be able to map where the seizures are coming from. But also, um, but also map where their functions are. So you've heard at this conference uh, probably about stereo EEG. This is, these are depth electrodes. So these are electrodes that are passed through the scalp through very small, usually about three millimeter incisions. And what we're trying to do is target the extent of where the epilepsy is coming from. And we can um, hopefully then target um, what might be a resectable uh, area of, of uh, seizures. Yes, sir. So, is this the one that's primarily used for surgery evaluation? <laughs> um, so, this is where I'm really dating myself. So, back in the old days, when I told you we did with x rays and air and stuff like that, uh, we did only depth electrodes. And um, there, again, because we didn't have really good imaging, you know, there was a higher risk of bleeds and hemorrhages and. and if we hit a vessel or hit a bad spot or you know wrong place, that kind of thing. Um, so as a result, surface electrodes came on the scene because now we could place those electrodes not through the brain but on the surface of the brain such that we can now um, do that safely in an open way for us to do that. What's happened now in the last five, I would say sort of the last five, seven years is that we've moved back to the depth electrodes because our imaging has gotten so good that we can now target those specific abnormalities, place electrodes in them. So patients with tuberous sclerosis or um, scar tissue or dysplasias or those kinds of things, we can actually place the electrodes exactly where we want and we can do it safely. And so there's been this sort of swinging of the pendulum back toward SEEG. So we do both, but it depends on why we're doing it. Yes? Do you have a seizure Correct. So this is, my, this is my next example. So here was that picture I showed earlier um, with the young man who had the MEG who had some areas of abnormality in, in this area. Here's the SEG. So what we were trying to do was to surround that area with our depth electrodes. Um, we waited for them to have, typically we want them to have three of their typical seizures so that we can see not just where the seizures start, but how they spread and what's the connections in the network. 
Um, and so we typically would like to see three. That's why you'll hear that they'll be in the epilepsy monitoring unit for a week because we want to capture those seizures. And if they don't have seizures more often than, let's say, one a week, then we'll lower medicines in order to kind of induce seizures so that we can sort of see where things might be targeted. So this allows us to, in 3D planning, to be able to make a decision on where to uh, do the resection. Okay? So here's, a, here's what I mentioned. Um, here's this area after we did the resection. And you can see, you know, this was an area that we had surrounded by the, the depth electrodes. The brain where all those electrodes are or were um, doesn't look disrupted. There's no hemorrhages. There's no um, complications in that perspective. And so this is why we've sort of moved in that direction. Does that make sense? Okay. If we were to find that we couldn't localize the seizures, we might go to a different strategy, which includes the surface. And I'll talk about that in a sec. So here's a deep lesion. This is a, what's called an insula. So it's uh, here in the dominant hemisphere. This is a very sensitive deep area, so it's not an easy surgical um, site for us to go after. Um, as a result, if we want to try to figure out where the seizures are coming from in this area, it requires us to do a combination. So let's pretend that this square here is, the, um, is that insular lesion. Um, so what we would then do, thinking about our depth electrodes or our SEEG, is we basically want to surround it. So we put electrodes sort of around um, that um, lesion. Uh, here's another picture if we were looking at it from the side. And you can see, you know, how we've targeted this area and placed uh, electrodes around the lesion. Um, here's an example in that particular case of how we surrounded that insular lesion. And then we did it as a combination. So you can see where we then put the surface electrodes right on top of it. So we had the combination of the being able to record from a deep structure, but also record from the, the surface cortex. Okay. No. No, this is where we have to open it. If we're going to do surface electrodes, we have to do it through a much larger um, exposure. And the reason to do that is, is so that we have a wider um, visualization um, to do it safely, but also to allow us to do our mapping. Okay. So here's, here's a typical picture that was, this is not the same patient, but here's a grid over a very large area of the brain which allows us to um, examine here. This is the temporal lobe here. Here's the frontal lobe, occipital lobe back here. Parietal lobe is in this area. And so, for example, in these patients, everything gets sutured back up. They go to the epilepsy monitoring unit. We wait to have two or three of the typical seizures. But the nice thing also with this is that we can also uh, do mapping. So in this particular case, we want to, what you can do is not only record from those electrodes, and you can do these from the depths also, but you can also stimulate back along those electrodes in order to interrupt a function. So let's go back to my example. We might have a patient um, with these in. We kind of get a feel for where their seizures are coming from, but we want to see if it's in a language area. So then they would start me with counting. So count, um, David, and so I would go one, two, three, we'd give a stimulus, and if I went, uh, 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 then we would know that that was an area that was important for me uh, to do motor function. If, on the other hand, we were saying, okay, um, uh, do that counting again, and it, it stops their, their speech, and they're trying to get it out, and they seem to know the, n the number, um, that might indicate that that's more of a motor area of speech. So we can make a determination for our understanding of counting or our understanding of speech versus the motor of speech. Both of those are important. Wernicke's area is considered the understanding of speech. That's then connected through a series of fibers to here, which is Broca's area, which is our motor speech. And so this is how we tease out how close the seizure focus may or may not be. So if we go to this picture, if the seizures are coming from this area and that's where Wernicke's area is, that's not really a safe area for us to take out. 
because then we would disrupt their ability to understand speech. Yes. Well, the longest I've left them in with Dr. Holder uh, was three and a half weeks. Um, we usually don't like to go beyond two, um, but we were getting enough abnormal electrical activity. We kind of kept hoping we would get a, a typical seizure, and so uh, we left it in those long, in that long. Did you get one? Yes, we did. <laughs> now, I have to also be honest. Um, sometimes when we use the depth electrodes or even the surface, less often. Um, if we happen to hit the target, um, there is one, a couple of patients where by putting in the depth electrodes, there wasn't anything on the scan, but we must have disrupted the network because we didn't get any seizures. We ended up taking the electrodes out and they remained seizure free. So um, I haven't got a good explanation other than we must have disrupted the network inadvertently by placing the electrodes where we thought the seizures were coming from. So. Um, even though you may not see a hemorrhage or scar tissue or any abnormality, there can be on a microscopic level enough to disrupt things. And that's particularly true with some of the patients with tuberous sclerosis. Okay. So just, I'm, I'm going to just briefly, just in time, just um, this list has grown. So these are the different surgical treatment options. Um, we tend to, um, when we want to shoot for a cure, we tend to do the resective operations. When we're really trying to palliate or trying to reduce the seizures or reduce the, the impact of the seizures, we might do more disconnective procedures or neuromodulation. So again, you've heard at this conference about VNS, they're out there, RNS, uh, which is neuropace, vagal nerve stimulation from Leva Nova, and deep brain stimulation. This is really a progression of how we would do neuromodulation. Vagal nerve stimulation is, a very, is the least um, invasive. It has uh, lowest risk, uh, potentially you know, high benefit. Uh, we go to responsive neurostimulation if we're in an area that we find from our evaluation that um, we can't take out because it's um, in an eloquent area of cortex or it's in multiple locations. So we really start, can't start taking out multiple parts of the brain. So, um, so I think that you know this list, uh, this is really actually a very, very old slide, but I keep adding to it. Um, and so we're starting to see you know, maybe in the next, um, well, high frequency or HIFU is coming out very soon. That's kind of an ablation using ultrasound, so you maybe not even have to place a laser probe. Uh, that may be kind of exciting in the next few years. Uh, some of these others may be uh, useful for different seizure syndromes, but again, they would be uh, along this line of uh, neuromodulation. So um, stay tuned. Each of these expos hopefully will bring new things. Yeah, so that's where the, the idea would be is to uh, come up with, let's say, some stem cells that they convert to um, producing drug, so you could actually inject those cells um, that would then produce the drug. So instead of taking a pill, that it's producing the um, chemical or the, the drug's chemical right in the area where you want it to work. So there's some early research in that area. And, um, uh, I'm interested to see how that turns out. So. so just in summary, again, we know that intractable epilepsy significantly impacts mortality, morbidity, and quality of life. Um, we know that if surgery is an option, um, uh, we, um, it should be um, further investigated, and that's really what the reason for this talk was about. We know that the best outcomes, whether they be um, surgical or otherwise, are best when we can um, localize the seizures and identify the seizure network. Particularly, you know, one of the things that came up in some earlier talks about why do genetic testing? Well, genetic testing changes the medical therapy that you would give for different patients. So, for example, the Dravet's patients completely were, you know, treated a different and, a, and in a wrong way until the genetics of that was identified. Uh, we know that technology is going has gone a long way for us to be able to know where the seizures are coming from, and as a result, new therapies, new surgeries, new options have really come along with that. And we know that good outcomes lead to whole new lives. Um, this was a patient of mine. Um, interestingly, she was a uh, 
she originally came to me when she was about 15 years old and she was having uh, bad seizures. Uh, we evaluated her, we confirmed that it was coming from her um, right temporal lobe. Um, interestingly enough, um, her seizures were coming about once a month. She was not well controlled on meds. Um, but um, the family, the parents were really not comfortable with her um, having brain surgery. Um, she came to us a month after her 18th birthday, said uh, she can sign, and so she did, and she had surgery, and she's been seizure-free since. Now it's about 15 years. So, um, so there are possibilities when we can identify where those seizures are coming from and, and truly treat them in this way. So surgery is not as aggressive as the potential for continuing to have seizures. So, so with that, it is a team, and, and any of the, the centers that you visit or that you work with um, you know, have a team. They should have the neurology and epilepsy people, neurosurgery, all the others, and I really couldn't have done any of this without uh, the team that we have, luckily, in, in Phoenix. So uh, with that, I thank you, and I'm happy to take any more questions. Yes, ma'am. Um, the one woman right behind you. Of what syndrome? I'm sorry. Okay. You've, you've had, you've, you've never had imaging? No. Oh, yeah. You absolutely should have imaging. Okay. Um, and it, um, because um, there was a patient that we had who had seizures and had gone, had responded to, a, um, a, well, it was febrile seizures, and then came back about six months later and had another seizure, and then they put him, the patient on meds. This was at another institution. And then they kept having seizures, and they just kept changing meds, and the child came to us. And um, they indeed had febrile seizures, but um, we also found a brain tumor. So, I mean, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, I think if it was a one-time seizure, some would even argue with two seizures, there's not really a lot to do with it. But if, if they're having more than that, and even with a diagnosis of Deuce syndrome or Dravet's, which we know doesn't necessarily have any lesional relationship. As I pointed out earlier, um, the, the standard, minimum standard is, is imaging plus EEG. And what I mentioned earlier is we're a bit more aggressive because um, the people who kind of develop resting state for pediatric epilepsy are with us. So we do resting state, which is a functional imaging. The children don't need to lay still because they're sedated. They could be done sedated. Uh, we have a protocol for that. So we do um, the history, the semiology, uh, anatomic imaging, um, video EEG, um, as well as the um, functional imaging. And, and that's our standard set. And uh, clearly, if there's not any localized localization, well, then, of course, we have all the other metabolic testing, genetic testing, whatever it takes. But um, at a minimum, they, they should have imaging. Now, my very, very strong opinion, but we would not let a patient go who's had more than two seizures without some sort of imaging. Yeah, we're more like 15, 20 a day and not had any imaging? Okay. I'm sorry if I seem incredulous, but I am. Yeah. But you're, you said you're in Seattle? Yeah, we're in Seattle. And they don't want to do it? I'm surprised. Hmm. Get a, yeah, get a second opinion. You bet. You had a question for me. Mm-hmm. Mm. 
Well, I mean, it, again, it depends. If they're thinking it's a seizure syndrome, then the functional imaging would be quite effective. Um, if it was behavioral issues, that's still areas that are kind of researchy, still science. Um, if we can pick up where we're, we're doing work in looking at autism, we're looking at other behavioral things with the resting state, but it's, it's still in the, the research phase. Yeah, so. Oh, yeah. Well, um, did they get? Uh, did they work on a diagnosis of Landau-Kleffner? Because that's also a nonverbal um, self Landau-Kleffner syndrome. It's it's a seizure syndrome that's often very difficult to diagnose, and it's developmental delay with language issues, those kinds of things, and uh, that might be something to discuss with them. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm the neurosurgeon. You better ask the neurologist that one. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. I mean, we always do workups. I mean, so, I mean. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, no, just. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, we would, depending on who the neurologist is, it would just have to be referred in for the imaging. That's it? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's an eight year old, so it's Yeah, well, I mean, if she has behavioral issues, yeah, then yeah. just needs sedation, that's all. Yeah, no, we do, so okay, we do it, we do infants, so, yeah. You're in Phoenix, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Right at Children's Hospital. Yeah, well, I, I can, I know the institute. Oh, okay, great. Okay, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome so much.